25 that's like 35 years old, and you both throw a bunch of money at it, and you finally win. And this other guy put you through so much, you want to kill him. And there's nothing I want more than to find the guy who you know, lost to me, you know, get him to get on his little Skype thing, where he'll like, are you there? Hey, hey, Patriot 421, these stupid eBay names. <laughs> hey, and I want him to see me, because I'll be standing there naked, completely naked, <laughs> holding the single, the punk rock single. Like, hey, remember this? This is the single that you wanted. I'm the guy I want it from you. Okay, I'm backing up into a wide shot. That's right, I'm naked. Check it out. Okay, here's the single. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You know why I'm doing this? Because I can. Because I can. I can do anything I want with this because it's mine. Because you didn't win it. I want it! Oh, oh, oh. Are you looking? Are you looking? Are you looking? Are you looking? Okay. Oh, oh, oh! I broke it in half! I have three of these. I just didn't want you to have it. <laughs> oh. Do you see how bad my life is without you? It sucks! So next time, ten nights. And so... When I'm off the road, I, I go into a rut immediately. Basically, life is uh, on cassette. It's a tape. It's going by. I'm on pause, but the tape is still rolling. By the second time I go to the grocery store, I feel I'm not trying hard enough. I should be out, you know, not sleeping with the agony of a show every single night. Don't screw this up. The, the, the Damoclean sword of obligation hanging over my head, suspended by the single horse hair. That's what I want. That keeps the blood thin. When I'm off the road, I feel completely useless. And so when I'm there, I have my small publishing company. Many, many years ago in the 90s, there was an amazing woman running my company because I'm not around. She's still with the company, but now she does accounting all the way from Oregon, thanks to the internets. But she used to be at the office running the joint. And at one point, somewhere in the 90s, she said, I was off the road, she said to me, things are going very well. We need to staff up, so we need someone else. So I said, Carol, this is your company to run. You, you pick that person. She said, well, I know, I already have. And the new hire is coming in in about an hour. I said, OK, cool. And I look out the window, and I, and I notice there's a broomstick you know, just floating in the driveway. Odd. And our office at that time was on Hollywood Boulevard. And you had to keep your doors locked. Just, you know, there was a lot of uh, riffraff out there. Anyway, the, the locks of the door just open. I'm like, OK, there's an alien force walking into our building. And in comes the new hire. It's parents, if you will. It's hosts. Uh, named it Heidi years ago when it ripped out of his leathery egg sack that had been somehow deposited in his backyard. And they named it Heidi, they sent it to school. Uh, it walked into my office on its little hooves, and its, its, its little vertical pupils beheld me, and its angry reptilian tail twitched in agitation. And his first words out of this thing's mouth was, I am my boss! A testicle fell <laughs> down my pant leg and rolled across the office. <laughs> and that was the end of that. <laughs> and within three hours, I'm taking orders from this thing, which I immediately named the demon. And so the demon runs my life. Whenever I come to the office, there it is. You're late! Like, it's, it's 8.58. I don't have to deal with you until 9. Shut up! And that's not how it speaks, that's just how I imitate it. And all we do is argue. And the thing came into my office a few months ago. I was off the road, click it, clip it, clip it, clip it. Yeah, how many years I've been here? I said, five ice ages. Shut up! Fourteen years! Fourteen years. Look at me. Before that thing was hired at my company, I was tall, blonde haired, blue eyed, straight white teeth, amazing breasts. Look at me! Anyway, this thing is killing me. And all we do is fight. And this, all we do is like <laughs> it, it never stops. And, and somehow we get things done. And we go places, you know, eating or sh wherever. And I'll <laughs> and people go, how long have you two been married? <laughs> Which always elicits the same response in me. <laughs> no, please! You'd be lucky! <laughs> and it is married. This guy married it. His name is Anthony. I've renamed him St. Anthony, and I've been calling him that for so long, he doesn't even notice anymore. And whenever I see the two of them together, I always ask the same question. I go, hey, St. Anthony, how do you do it? Like, how do you live with the, the thing? And she's like in the corner, like, shit. Yeah. And he goes, I don't know, man. She comes back from your place. She's all worn out. She's like a lamb. He said, I'd like to thank you, because I think you wear her out during the day. 
anyway, uh, several months ago, the Demon and I were in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we were there to see the legendary band Iggy and the Stooges play, because we're Iggy fanatics, and so we went out to see the show. And we're standing in front of the legendary Ig, you know, the heavyweight champion of rock and roll. And I can't say I know the guy, but you know, he remembers my name, and I see him every great once in a while, shake the hand, and kind of am awed by his Igness. And we're standing there, and we're both huge fans, and we can't help ourselves. There's Iggy Pop. We're like, shut up, Iggy, 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 Iggy. And he looks over at the both of us. Oh, you know, uh, you guys act like you're married, man. I'm like. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, um, I'm off the road a few months ago with the demon, and it comes clopping into my office on this little hood. Get out! And I'm so whipped by this thing, I just take my orders. I don't even think, I just respond as Pavlovian at this point. I stand up, yeah. Get your keys and get your wallet, we're going to Costco! We need to buy a ladder and some paper! Translation. Costco, I don't know if you have them here, England has them. Costco is a store where one buys for keeps. It's a store the size of Indiana. It's huge. And a lot of Americans, they, they medicate what they think are their deficiencies and flaws in their character and their body by, well, I'm a man who no longer has it, so I'll buy a bigger TV and feel better about myself. My hair is going, so I'll buy a Porsche. I mean, people medicate with sometimes pizza. Sometimes they medicate with, uh, you know, a flat screen TV. And I'm sure there are aspects of your economy that are consumer driven. I'm not an expert on, on Belgian economics, but I'm sure there's a lot of stores where I'm selling a lot of stuff. In my country, as you know, some will tell you that America is broke. Look, America's broke. It, it's not broke at all. It's fabulously wealthy. It's just like only eight people have the money. Uh, otherwise, I was like, oh, please. And these, these people are like, no, no, we, we have to keep it. Well, why can't you let a little bit of it out? That socialism can't do that. <laughs> and like, non-white people will get it, and they'll start to read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff. We can't let you know stuff because then you won't say yes to the next fake war. So go work three jobs and stop being such a leech. Get away from me. And so Americans take their credit card, which now just has a clown's face on it. <laughs> and they just buy crap from China and hope to die painlessly. And Costco is where you do that. And, and so I said, we're going to Costco. Shut up! I'm like, wow. And so we're leaving the building. And I don't know if any of you ever wasted uh, any of your time thinking about, you know, how does Henry live? It don't. It's, you know, it's nothing to it, really. Uh, you probably think that I might live in some huge palace of solitude with a, with a line of Lamborghinis outside in my parking lot next to a kennel of 18-year-old Hungarian trick-ass bitches who are always semi-naked, surviving on lean meat and vodka, always ready for an orgy at my car. No, 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 and no, 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 I guess I didn't say no to all the rest of them. I live alone, I eat with a microwave, I drive a, a Subaru Outback, the one that no one wanted, the champagne gold colored one. <laughs> Many years ago, my 5,000 year old car, you know, made of wood, just fell over. I said, I hear Subarus always start up. And so I went to go see Bill Subaru and his lot of cars. I said, sir, I'd like to buy a Subaru Outback, I'd like to buy it today. He said, well, you and everyone else, citizen, and there's only one left, and there it is. I said, wow, well, ha, ha. It's just a urine colored car. It's like the worst mistake ever to be painted onto a car, but I bought it. I bought it the way Charlie Brown uh, bought the anemic Christmas tree at the Peanuts uh, Christmas special. Like, oh, I'll take you home, urine colored car. And so that's what I drive, and it never fails. It just looks really bad. But at my age, it, it all looks really bad. So just drive the freaking car and get it over with. Anyway, the demon and I get into the now legendary Subaru Outback, and we leave Hollywood, California, and we start driving to Burbank, California, home of Disney, home of Warner Brothers, home of Costco. And as we're driving, I say to the demon, I never call it, hey, demon. I always say, hey, the demon, because it's, you know, I'm trying to be respectful. <laughs> and it threatens to sue me all the time. Anyway. So I said, hey, the demon, I've been told that one needs a Costco membership card in order to purchase things at Costco, and I certainly don't have one, and um, I don't know if you do, and it reaches into its uh, vulture gut purse and pulls out a con, like, ah! 
up! Shut up! So I keep driving. And several minutes later, we descend into the evil poisonous cloud that is uh, Southern California. The, 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 the poisonous gases from all kinds of emissions go over, out of Hollywood, over the mountains, and drop into the valley and go, <sighs> breathe me. And you, you can like, pick the clouds of death out of the air and go, wow. Wow, I'm going to live eight minutes less by just, just breathing. And so this cancerous lump it comes obscenely out of the earth. It's Costco. You can see it in the great misty distance. And the parking lot around Costco is the size of the Pentagon parking lot because so many shoppers need to consume now and they need a place to park their SUV. And so we orbit Costco looking for a place to park my dinky machine. And it's SUV after SUV all with a Bush Cheney sticker on the back half rising into the warm Californian sun thinking that maybe if I keep the sticker on the bumper, they'll come back. If I just hold on and keep the sticker fixed to the bumper by force of will and lots of stickers, they'll come back and like rock this house party one more time. And so finally, I, I park the vehicle and we get out like, let's go! It's like leaving like pat as we go. And I find a shopping cart that's been slammed into a light pole that's quadruple wide. It has shock absorbers. You're going to buy a whole lot of stuff at Costco. And so we're pushing you know, like a quarter mile you know, across the rolling waves of concrete and SUVs. And we get to the front of Costco. And I've only been to one in my life because I said I'll never go to Costco. But of course, the demon took me down. And so the front of this Costco is a utilitarian food court where the Americans are feeding on cheap calories. And cheap calories are the worst thing a human can ingest in that uh, they slow your heart down, they thicken your blood to the consistency of syrup. It's like processed food, basically, and it can be made by the ton incredibly cheap. And on this day, the Americans are feeding on five-inch corn tortilla chips, like the size of a CD, covered in uh, pounds of that cheesy liquid that purports itself to be uh, cheese or dairy, but it is not. It's developed in the laboratories of Dow and Monsanto, the same people who gave you Agent Orange back in the good old days. And so it's an elective. You can put on as much as you want, and since it's free, it, a lot is good. And there's this idea of quantity equaling quality in my country that's going to kill many of my fellow Americans. Like, this is crap, but it's cheap, but it's crap, but it's cheap. And so we see the Americans laboring through this meal. Now, uh, people, the elite, uh, they eat, they dine. You like to eat food that tastes good, food that was uh, cooked with love with skill, with a sense of perfection, with your delight in mind. On the other hand, orca feeds. You can take a seal and throw it at an orca and go, what does a seal taste like? I'm a killer whale, I just feed. Okay, we just dipped the, the seal in hot mustard. Did you like the taste of that seal better? I don't do taste, I just do the genetic impulse to go forward. That's what these Americans are doing. It is a joyless task. They are laboring through this meal. They are running the gauntlet of this meal. And they have to eat it quickly because every second is getting colder and colder, becoming harder and harder. After about 180 seconds, it'll be this congealed rubbery mass that you can kill a dog with if you throw it at its head. And so you see these Americans plowing through this meal like they're going to win some kind of door prize if they can self-masticate this mass, this bolus of ill health down their neck super fast. And you see what I own. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, okay, okay, oh, they're going blue, the circulation is slowing down. And under a, a microscope scrutiny, this cheese-like substance is just millions and millions of fat-ass cells. Literally, huge men with their pants halfway down displaying this obscene amount of ass crack. And they deploy into your arteries and adhere to your arterial walls, ass out. But trampling any blood cell naively trying to get down to your heart to the point where the blood cell parts would you see me would you move your fat ass no and if we don't eat like this all the time Al Qaeda wins I mean I don't know well I just don't understand why you would do that to yourself anyway uh, they're there like, ah, and you can hear them under their breath like, ah, ah, you were there. In a word, ghastly. Anyway, we go by them, and the doors of Costco open, and you go into this massive building uh, that has like one mile long fluorescent bulbs overhead. 
and I see things, products that I have grown up with in America, but never in quantities like this. We have, as you probably have your equivalent, a chocolate chip cookie mass produced called Chips Ahoy. You might even have it as an import or domestically made either. It comes in a light blue bag, this processed chocolate chip cookie, like three across, four back, and you absentmindedly eat them as you watch reruns of Star Trek. That's what Americans do, as it just like basically fills you up like, you're dying, you're dying, you're dying, and you eat them because your girlfriend laughs, or you feel bad about yourself, or, you know, does your ass look fat in these pants? Yes, because you're eating these cookies in city. Anyway, in Costco, they have 100 pound gunny sacks of Chips Ahoy cookies, like up to here, with that red and white nylon string at the top that you would <laughs> rip open with your quadruple paper so it never rips open. You can drop this out of an airplane to starving Biafrans and the bag will not explode. And you see people like four or five of these in their cars. Now, why do they need 100 pounds of Chips Ahoy cookies at a time? The answer is simple. You need to dump the entirety of the bag on your living room floor for when your 19 children come back from Bible study class. They will descend upon this mass of processed food and eat, and all you'll hear is, I eat And the reason you need to uh, uh, set up this pre dinner meal is if you don't feed them, they will eat each other. Because two weeks ago, you had 21 children. And all you, you came back after hearing the screams and all you found was 19 children splattered in blood. No one wanted the intestines. And so the rest of Zebulon is inside your children's stomachs. So unless you want your, your, uh, your family to be like a Serengeti watering hole feeding frenzy of their own, because you're gonna need to keep breeding because we got a ran to kill, right? So you gotta keep pumping them out. So you gotta give them the cookies before the crappy meal so they can, you know, be great Americans and love God. And so you'll see Americans underneath these lights paralyzed with choice. They are not spoiled for choice. They're paralyzed by choice. They, in fact, want to buy everything in the store, own it, and control it so they can kill it. And you'll see men standing looking at this, this consumerist nirvana, gently dry humping the air, fingers twitching, like, I want to buy all of it. I want to own it. Now you'll see them hugging a 100-pound bag of Doritos corn chips. <laughs> uh, I love you, uh, I love you more than mommy. I mean, it's weird, man. <laughs> so, I'm standing there clocking the shoppers, and I notice that there's a lot of people who are too good of health to, to shop upright. Uh, their health is not good, so they need to sit and shop. And if you have a spill in aisle five, that's one thing, but a dead body in aisle five is a no-go. People are like, come out, you know, consumes fast. So no dead bodies, and so no heart attacks are allowed. And so what they've done, they've taken one of those hover-round vehicles for people who are not ambulatory, and they have crudely welded a shopping cart to the front. So you can sit and shop, and you see people drive up to what they want. And this, this man wheels by me in one of these electronic carts. I go, morning, sir. White power, son. <laughs> uh, I don't where you are. Anyway, uh, of course the demon knows the lay of the land. It's like one of the many rungs of hell this thing hangs out in. Let's go to Hardware City! It's like this massive part of the store is all hardware. And like we find Ladder Alley, and the demon instructs me, Buy a ladder! And it turns its back on me. All I can see is it's like its neck scales and its tail as it, as it walks away. And all you guys, you are men. I'm sure you are. You can clean a rabbit. You can listen to a car and go, nah, here, pop, pop the hood. No, there, now try it. No problem. I'm not that guy. I was raised by an erotic woman to the left of my mother's Joan Baez and a wall. I was raised with Mozart, Bob Dylan, Miles Davis, and one tool in all the small apartments we bounced around the Washington, D.C. area in the 1960s and 70s with. Um, it was a rubber-handled pair of needle-nose pliers with a wire cutter in the middle with which we stripped every nut and bolt of every TV antenna and toaster oven as we neurotically got through to my 18th year where she kicked me out into the real world. And so when you say, buy a ladder, <laughs> you buy one. I have no idea. I'm not like a tool guy. I'm not a real man in the Hemingway sense of the word. I'm just kind of good looking and you know, love poetry. And super available. Anyway, so, so 
I'm surrounded by ladders. It's not like one or two, it's like 500 ladders. And I don't know what to do. So I look to my side and I see a ladder that's this big. I'm like, damn. And it says on the sticker, 12 foot ladder with telescoping legs. Like the legs are like, I bought it because it looked neat. And I throw it into the car, I go, hey, the demon, I bought a ladder. I get to be happy with me. Let's go to Paper World! It cares not. <laughs> And it goes this way, and I follow the demon, and we come to this massive intersection of linoleum. And I look from side to side to make sure no one in a shopping cart will mow me down. And I start like the, the several meter walk across the shining linoleum to apparently paper world. It's a forest of pay processed paper goods that way. And as I'm walking, I see coming ever closer an elderly gentleman who's standing by himself. His pants are about up to here. His right arm is trembling freely. And he's wearing one of those ridiculous caps, which I don't know if you have here. I'm going to do my best to explain it to you. You probably can remember it from a JPEG somewhere. It's a baseball cap, but it's designed slightly differently to afford the wearer about six to nine inches of headspace between the scalp and the top. So basically, when you, when you sport it, your head looks like a boat oar, or like you've been drinking the water in Arkansas your entire life. Like, And they give it to uh, veterans of ancient wars and uh, fascists who win NASCAR events. And they put them on their head, and you're like, you look silly. The guy's wearing one of those and just like standing there hanging out on his own. And as I wheel by him, he points into the car and says, So, you gonna buy that ladder? Which is kind of a strange question in that it's in my cart. What am I doing with it now? Just walking around Costco, like showing off. Hey, baby. <laughs> Queries. I what, what are you what doing with it? And then I think, I, I realized at that moment, I, I said, I think I've met the loneliest man in Burbank. And it very well could be that his wonderful wife of many years has passed away, and his children, if he had them, are gone. And maybe he's the survivor of some awful, horrific uh, American siege on another country, and his head is full of nightmares and ghosts and demons and blood. And, and maybe he punctuates his incredible loneliness and depression at the pensioner's home, where he no longer makes friends with people, because all they do is quietly die in their rooms and they're discreetly wrapped in a bed sheet and taken away by the sad ambulance attendants and taken to the morgue. So he, he has no friends at the old folks' home. So he punctuates his great depression and misery and loneliness by going to Costco and standing in the middle of it waiting for anyone to walk by so he can have a weird, non-sequitur conversation about the items in their cart. I have just tied an incredibly long tail onto that man's kite bio, but he seemed incredibly lonely. Now, do I have time for an old man who wants to talk about a ladder? Are you kidding? No problem. So I stopped and said, yes, sir. I absolutely intend on buying this ladder. He said, well, it looked like a real good one. I said, sir, let's take your statement and turn it into an assertion and make it prove itself. Huh? I'm starting to lose it just a minute. And I flipped the ladder over and showed this beautiful blue and orange sticker. Uh, that has 12 to 14 bullet points as to the attributes of this ladder. I said, sir, let's deconstruct your statement, go through the bullet points in order, and discuss, shall we? Huh? I go, I'll leave. <laughs> bullet point number one, the legs telescope to 12 feet in height. That's handy. Bullet point number two, holds 242 pounds of body weight before becoming destabilized, before it tests the ladder to its physiological limits, sir. I think I fall below that weight category, so I think this ladder could be just the one for me. Well, you look like you're in shape. I go, sir, thank you. Like my anger, I work on my physique every damn day. And so then we go into ladder talk, a very deep discussion on what a man can do in a house with a ladder. And at one point he says, well, I need to get one of these. I said, absolutely, sir. I mean, you're obviously very busy around the house. And this ladder might be just the thing you need. And around that time, the demon comes up, clip it, clap me. What are you doing talking about? Which makes the nice old man say, oh, it looks like your wife is here. <laughs> no, please. And now he's like, you two should leave. And so I, I said to the man, I said, look, sir, maybe one day, if I'm lucky, our paths will cross again, and I'll walk by you and we'll talk about some other item in my cart. Until then, and I tried to shake his hand, but it, 
kept getting away from me. So. Anyway, we get to paper world, and I, honestly, I forget what chunk of processed paper the demon hurled into our cart, but it did. Like, let's leave! I said, no, actually, we're not going to leave. We're going to spend quite a bit of time in Costco, because I'm now actually fascinated by the phenomenon of Costco. I want to see everything that's for sale. I was just, the place freaked me out. And so I have the car keys, we're not leaving until I'm done. I get to be the boss every now and then, it's great. And so we're going up and down the aisles looking at these huge things for sale. And we find ourselves in liquor world, which is like the rear third of, of the Costco. And I know that some of you have uh, liquor smarts. I'm not calling you a bunch of drunks. I'm just saying that you know the difference between uh, bourbon, scotch, and whiskey, and gin, and vodka. I, I, I do not. I know there is a difference. I just can't tell you what they are. I'm just not up on my liquor facts. And so if you put you know, vodka and gin next to each other, it just looks like water in a bottle to me. I, don't, I can't tell you why they're different and what you do with them except get drunk. And I think that in a lot of liquor stores or a lot of wonderful bars, they have all the alcohol lined up. Like we have the champagne for the champagne people, the gin for the gin freaks, and the, the whiskey maniacs. They got the whiskey over here. At Costco, things are sold in this kind of big box utilitarian fashion. And I think the pallet driver just backs it up. And, me, me, me. Clear spirit. <laughs> Brown spirit. <laughs> Beer. <laughs> Wine. <laughs> in a fight or an altercation at Costco, stand next to one of the massive 50-gallon wax cartons of wine and put your, put your arm on it. And the next person who passes you by, they, excuse me, from which vineyard were these grapes gathered? <laughs> what? Is this a wine from France? Is it a wine from Australia? Is this wine from Northern California, Napa? From which vineyard were these grapes begatted, is what I'm asking. <laughs> it says fortified on the side, what more do you need to know? You drink it all weekend and chase your wife around the kitchen table, and if you don't drink it, Al Qaeda wins. <laughs> and so, <laughs> alcohol world was a total bummer to me. It's always, always like defeat, depression, and domestic violence, so I'm out. Now. So I said, the demon, let's leave. And so we're pushing a quarter mile towards cash out, and we inadvertently walk through the smallest section of Costco, the book section. And even an airport bookstore has like thrillers, fiction, nonfiction, you know, health, uh, you know, gay and lesbian studies, ooh, we're growing up. And things are happening, but not at Costco. There's like five books for sale, a whole lot of them, on this huge table. <laughs> Fox News host, another Fox News host, psycho misogynist, fascist, racist radio host who characterizes the first lady Michelle Obama as that porch monkey. And then the new autobiography, fresh off the printing press from the last president of the United States, Decision Points by George W. Bush. A book whose title is as obtuse as the man's eight years in office. And as many of you know, I was quite obsessed with George W. Bush. And that English is the only language I have. And you sexy Europeans have, obviously, too. And I admire that. I would love to read the French in French. I would love to read the Russians in Russian. But all I have is English, and a tenuous hold on it at best. And, and a little bit of Spanish that is atrophied to like one or two words from 1850 when I was in 10th grade. I took Spanish for a while and it was great, it was easy, it was like Latin, but I never used it and it went away. And so I would watch my president with a great amount of interest because I would watch him wrestle English to the ground. It was like Bush contra English, Bush v the English language. Like, I'm gonna take on these word things. I'm gonna decide to say something. And, I never understood if George W. Bush was intellectually disengaged from the material or if he was doing some kind of three-level chess game with English, taking it to a level that my intellectual arms are too short to grasp. Or was he an avant-word poet that I just could not decipher? Or was he a guy who just loved to spend his days with his cat staring at the wall? Not thinking that much. Not, I don't think about a lot. And I would always wonder, like, what's going on in there? As he would stagger through the English language like a drunken frat boy trying to come home from a party. Like, hey, whoa, up through everyone's backyard. And you watched him speak, too. You could, and your English is perhaps your second or third or fourth or fifth language. Your, your English probably kicks his, 
English is ass. And you're like, why is he running your country? This is a bad idea. Let's keep watching. And so there was a few body kicks that always gave that president away. Uh, whenever he was about to say a polysyllabic word, you'd watch him white knuckle the podium. Like, oh, you're not so big. And that look of grim determination would drop like a curtain of intensity and intent over his face. I'm going to word fire right through this word. And he looked like a man about to run through five plates of glass, or a man about to put his naked fist through like four cinder blocks, like I can, I can do this. And then the word would come out, proliferator. And, and he wouldn't really know what it is to proliferate or where it comes from or whatever. And you'd see his head, you know, inflexibly slap to the side and his mouth gave open. Because at practice all afternoon, Condoleezza Rice had been throwing uh, anchovies into his mouth. And he'd say, good boy, you're a good boy, keep talking. Good, 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 good. He'd go, no, damn. And he would keep speaking. And apparently he wrote a book. And the book is a big, big, thick book. And I figured George W. Bush's autobiography would be a pamphlet. You know, I grew up, I did some things, love God, the end. <laughs> please don't want to go to jail. Please, please, please don't. Don't lock up any of my war criminal friends. Really don't want to go to jail. Love God. At the end again. I'm mortified. I, I'm out. Anyway, the book is huge. And I, I went and grabbed it. I'm like, oh. He's prepared to pay back. I must see! And I crack it open, and I immediately start reading out loud from this really awful book. And I'm doing my, my awful George W. Bush imitation out loud to amuse myself. At my age, there's a lot of self-amusement going on. <laughs> I'm sorry I have to tell you that. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm reading from this crap book. The medallions of the Marines shine valiantly in the morning sun. I knew I had to sign on something. And I hear laughter next to me. There's an adult woman standing next to me shopping for literary fare. And she's thinking I'm funny. She's digging me. I'm like, wow, I'll never leave. I'll read the whole damn book to her for I'm, I'm, I'm desperate for anyone's attention and approval. So I turn to her and give her a real-time audio book of you know, decision points. I'm, I'm really into it. And I notice across this table of crappy books, there's an adult man who's staring at me. I have not annoyed him. I've offended him sincerely. He is pissed. And every word that comes out of my mouth this, this look gets more and more, he's like sincerely angry, like he's going to start shaking. I am really pissing him off. And I feel the blood drain from my body to a lower part of my body, and I feel I'm getting stimulated because I want nothing more than for this guy to run around the table and straighten me out. Are you kidding? So I turn to him, and with everything in me, I project decision points to him to make him feel the full dramatic weight of my rendition. Now reading from decision points in an elevated DB, thus stopping all the shopping in a one-mile perimeter around the book section. Now, what this cracker doesn't understand is I've been getting stared at for about 30 years, and I've long gotten over myself. So self-conscious of me, that was back in the 80s when I looked like Jim Morrison. Now I'm just a gray-haired psycho. So I'll read as loud as damn well, please, hoping you'll come around and straighten me out, because I'd love to tear your head off. Why am I like this? I'm 50. I'm I can't understand, but I, I, I like it. And so I'm basically flexing the First Amendment in his face. Like, like, stop me. This is freedom of speech. You don't like it, you leave. And he does. Okay, so he's like, who needs it? He stalks off. And, and uh, the demon comes like, can we go now? I said, yeah, we can go. I'll allow you to let us leave. And so we go to the front. I give the withered the company credit card to the lady and she does the business and we go back to the car with a chunk of paper and the ladder, we drive back to the office and I load it all in and I put it down on the floor and said, so the demon, why don't we burn two and a half hours of our life to go to Costco? What are we using a ladder for? It points with this little clawed stub up at a light that is out in the ceiling. Fix it! And I said, the demon, could you have not put a fresh bulb in your fangs and crawl up the wall? <laughs> Upside down with your, with your sucker pads. <laughs> Shut up! And that's just another day in my America. And now you see what I get up to without you. Without you, my life sucks. It sucks.